Advancing the Kingdom, part two. Now, <clears throat> it's important to understand today's message that you listen to Advancing the Kingdom, part one. That was last Sunday. Today I'm going to talk about something that is so important. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Timothy that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now, usually we have scripture behind me. Um, we don't, we're not able to have scripture on the media today. So I'll just be calling out the scripture. If you want to write it down, you can write that down um, or not just take my word for it. I'm not going to be um, abusing the word or, or misquoting the word. I'm going to be speaking the word of God. But in 2 Timothy, it is written, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And many have been pierced by it and strayed away from the faith. Y'all have heard that scripture before, right? Okay. When you love money, it can develop into all kinds of things that will allow the devil to draw you away from the plan of God. Okay. So think about it. Think about it. A lot of people, they go and they work hard and they work hard and they go and do this and they go and do that. But yet... It's because they're being pierced and driven by a love for money, a love for greed, a love for something that they don't even know and even exist in their, inside of them at the time. But then the next thing you know, evil will come and evil will come. And the next thing you know, they're to a place where they never thought they would end up. They begin abandoning things, things that they once loved, things that they once held dear to their heart. And they abandon these things. And, and that is the way it is for the Christian. When we become a Christian, we love Jesus. We're in love with Jesus. We love coming to church. We love singing the songs. We love spending time in prayer with the Lord. But as time goes on, we begin to allow the spirit of mammon. And yes, and I will talk about this. The spirit of mammon. We will allow the love of money, the spirit of mammon, to come into, back into our life and draw us away from the things of God. And this morning, I want to talk to you about what is the number one thing that is plaguing the church, what is trying to stop the advancement of the kingdom of God. And it is the spirit of mammon. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. You know why? Let me tell you this. This is a fact. Jesus spoke more about money in the New Testament than any other subject. Why is it? Because it is a spirit that is alive and well. And it is a spirit that has been working in the heart of Cain. That's why he killed his brother Abel all the way till today. Why is it that Cain killed his brother? It was the spirit of mammon. He had a love for self. He had a love. He was greedy in his heart. He was corrupt. He was prideful. All of that is rooted in the spirit of mammon. The love of money. Now, we as Christians, we need to be broken free from the spirit of mammon. That's why a lot of churches are empty today because of the spirit of mammon. That's why a lot of Christian homes are broken because of the spirit of mammon. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. Do you agree with me this morning? Yes. Say amen. 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 You cannot serve God and mammon. Money. In Acts 2, 40 through 47, it says here in the New Testament church, when the church has been born, it says, and he, with many words, Peter testified and exhorted the people saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And Peter said, then those who gladly received his word, they were baptized and 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles' hands. And all who believed, they were together. They had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and their goods, and they divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved you know why because these people had just become Christians and they were so excited to do what God has always done and that is to give that is to share that is to have fellowship 
And they were, the door had been opened for these people, these human beings who were now adopted into the family of God. And this is what the early church were doing. They were selling their houses. They were selling things. And they were bringing all the money into the church and saying, who needs a need? Let, we've got the money. Let's help people. Let's feed people. Let's take care of things. Because they were free from the spirit of mammon. But you see, a lot now today, it's the opposite. A lot of people don't like to give. They'll give a little $50 here. They'll give a little $20 there. And I'm saying this because these are people who have $100,000, $200,000 jobs a year. And you see, you see, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about something that is so much greater. Time, talent, and treasure. And we're going to talk about treasure first. Why? Because treasure is what the Bible says, store it all in heaven. Store all your treasures in heaven. Store all your treasures in heaven. What is it that's in your heart that could be eternal? It's that relationship that you have with Jesus. It's the love of God that you have with Jesus. Those are the things that are eternal. And not only that, but when you do things for the sake of Jesus, for the name of Jesus, you're not saved by your works, but Christian, you're saved to do good works because you are the hands. You are the feet of Jesus Christ. You are the body of Christ. And though God can do anything, God chooses in his incredible plan. He chooses to use you, Christian, to do those good works today. Why? Because God rested from his works on the seventh day. It says he rested. What is the next thing God did? He came down as man, Jesus Christ, died on the cross, rose from the dead. Why? So that we can become alive, so that we can be set free from our sin. Amen. It's such an incredible honor to be in the house of God. To be, and I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about to be in the house of God. To be in his family. Christian, to have our names written in the Lamb's book of life. And in Acts 2, 40 through 47, the Bible says that they were breaking bread together. They were in prayer together. They were doing all these incredible things together. They were selling houses. They were selling land. They were bringing money to the, the, the feet of the apostles. And they were distributing among anyone who had need. It was equal now. People's needs were being met. Do you have a need this morning? You know how your need's going to be met? Let me tell you. Meet someone else's need. That's how the spirit of mammon is broken. The spirit of the love of money. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. All kinds of evil. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, again, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. This is a gift from God. Ephesians 2, 9 through 10. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. No. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece, Christian. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Your life was written out a long time ago. And though God is the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one who was and is and is to come, you were, he saw you before you were created in the womb of your mother. That's what he told Jeremiah and the old time prophet. Amen. And the same with you. He saw you before you were created. He had a designed, perfect plan for your life. But when we are born into this sin-filled world, God is not a master of puppets. God doesn't force you to do anything. God, before the garden and after the Garden of Eden, God has always honored your free will. And he always will honor your free will. And in eternity, he will honor your free will. And it was in our free will, born into this sinful world, that we chose to disobey God as we grew up. Amen. But God prepared works for you. He knew that, that when you would be exposed to the love of Christ, that when you would come to Jesus, that you would surrender your heart, that you would surrender your life, that everything that you have, you, you owe to Jesus because of what he did on the cross. The finished work of God's love on the cross. And so God has planned things for us to do. We're not saved by good works. We're saved to do good works. But we cannot do those works if we're bound by the spirit of mammon, by the love of money. Money is not evil, but to love it 
is. Because the Bible says the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your mind, body, and soul, and love your brother as well. Amen. True love is directed to God. The Bible says God is love. And that is why a lot of us cannot love each other because we don't know the true love, which is God. You cannot give something you do not have. You may be my best friend. And if you say, Michael, I need $100,000, $10,000. You may be my best friend, but I cannot give you what I don't have. But if I have the love of God, I can freely give it because I know Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. That is the love of God. And so this is what I'm talking about. We must be broken from the spirit of mammon to advance the kingdom of God. This is advance the kingdom, part two. And as Christians, we, we have to understand the world that we're living in today. Everybody has an agenda. Everybody has a plan. Everybody has a goal. What about the people of God? Those who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We don't have a plan. We don't have an agenda. No, we have a hope. And the hope is written in the written word of God. Just like they're changing, just like they're changing gender out there, the institution of marriage, they're trying to change the written word of God. And what does the Bible say about that? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall remain forever. Amen. They're fighting against God, and no one has ever won. Look, we're not called to hate anybody. We're called to hate sin. Okay, you need to learn to hate the sin but love the sinner. And that really means that you cannot be entertained by the sins of this world. And you cannot be desensitized by the sins of this world. We are called to advance a kingdom that will never perish. All of what you see in this world is perishing. It's perishing. And we need to understand, what are we fighting for today? What are we hoping for today? It's something that's unseen. God is unseen, but he's there. Just like the wind. You believe the wind. You can't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. The same with God. You cannot see God, but you see the effects of God. Why? By in the hearts of people. His people. How does God love people? Through his people. God advanced his kingdom by giving. And that is what I'm talking about this morning. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he what? Gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. God loves you. God is a cheerful giver. And that is what, how the kingdom of God is advanced. By giving. The kingdom of God is advanced by giving. Are you a giver? Or are you a taker? God is a cheerful giver. And when you give according to the will and the design of God, it brings life. It brings salvation. And it brings glory to him and to his kingdom. And guess what? People are going to get saved. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 7. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Paul says, And you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. In context of the chapter, this is talking about money. But let's go deeper than that. Giving of not just your treasure, but giving of your time. Giving of your talents. Every one of you has an anointing from God. Are you giving of your time? Are you giving of your talents? Are you giving of your treasure? In context of this chapter here. Are you giving? Look, I've heard that argument as long as I've been a Christian. Well, tithing doesn't uh, New Testament doesn't tell us that we need to tithe. You're absolutely right. There's only one place in the entire New Testament where Jesus says, yes, you should tithe. You should. You should do that. That's, but he's telling a Pharisee this. And, and, and if you want to get really down to what is the tithe, tithe is a 10% of everything you make. And the tithe was implemented in the law of Moses. 
But believers of God would tithe even before it was even commanded in the law of Moses. Abel did it, and it got him killed. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they tithed before the law of Moses was ever given to Israel that said, you must tithe. Now, let me just tell you this. New Testament, we're not bound by that. We're not bound to tithe. But let me tell you this. Tithing is a principle to where it's wanting to teach you what it means to be a New Testament giver. Because tithing is training wheels to becoming a New Testament giver. A giver will give more than a tither will. Now, I want you to think about that real hard. I stand on the word of God with that. A giver, New Testament giver, will give more than what the principle of tithing teaches. Because you see it in the book of Acts. They were selling their houses. They were selling their land. And they were bringing the money into the church, laying it at the feet of the apostles. Why? Because it would now be their responsibility at the heads of the church to distribute it to whoever had a need because the leaders knew the sheep. Didn't Jesus tell Peter, take care of my sheep, tend to my sheep? How can Peter do that if he's not given the resources to do that? How can the church do what the church is called to do if the resources are not given? It's not money. You know what it is? You ready? You ready for this? It's faith. Because it takes faith to sell your house, to sell your land, and say, here you go, here's all the money. It takes faith to do that. So don't look at it as money, it's faith. But that's why so many, that's why so many people run to the government for health care, Medicare, food stamps, because the church is empty, because there's no faith. You know before World War II, you know who used to take care of the orphans and the widows? Do your homework. It was the churches in America. They used to take care of all the people. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president of the United States, he's the one that brought in socialism reform and started doing food stamps where the government now is the big brother. The government now takes care of all of society. Before that, it was the church. And when the church saw, oh, we don't need to do that. The government's going to do it. It all went downhill. Because the Bible teaches us that it is the believers who meet the needs of society. Because Jesus is in us. When they all came to Jesus, they wanted to be hearing what Jesus had to say. And Jesus preached to them. And then they said, oh, Jesus, these guys are hungry. And Jesus said, you feed them. Well, how do we feed them, Jesus? Oh, oh well, give me, give me your fish. Give me your bread. And Jesus said, good. This boy gave what he had. This little boy gave what? A tenth. No, he gave everything he had. And it was God who's in the business of multiplying and met the needs of thousands. You see, y'all don't get what I'm saying. Y y some are going to say, oh, it, Michael's talking about money. I hardly ever talk about money. But this is the new year. There's a lot of new people in this church. A lot of people have left. This church has been through a living nightmare this past year. Where people have been attacked and uprooted. Don't let that be you. Satan is not done attacking the churches of Jesus Christ throughout this world. But this is the time where we must stand firm on the cornerstone Jesus Christ and say, I will not be shaken. I will not be stirred by the flames of hell. It will be the fire of God that will sustain me to do every good thing. You see, this ministry of giving, it, it, this is what Jesus did. Jesus said, I came to serve, not to be served. That's what Jesus said. And so when we come into the house, when we enter everyday life as a Christian, we need to be saying, Lord, how can I be effective in advancing your kingdom? And first, check it, being free from the spirit of mammon, money. Why is it that some people are not in the house of God today? Because they have to chase that dollar. Why is it that some people are not in the ministry, fulfilling the work of the ministry? Because they, they are chasing the spirit of mammon. 
I remember back in my early years, I was working 70 hours a week and pastoring full time. And I did it for two years. And I said, Lord, I will continue to do this, but my head and mind and heart are not in this job. It's in the church. But I'll do what you want me to do. Three days later, the Lord said, quit your job. I'm like, what? How am I going to pay my bills? And the Lord yelled at me in my spirit, quit your job. I pay your bills. And here I am many, many years later. I don't know how my needs are always met, but they're met. And I say it again. When you begin to say, first seek the, Matthew 6, 33, first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. That's Jesus, Matthew 6, 33. First seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. You seek him, and you know what it means to be a giver, because he's a giver. Jesus gave. He opened his arms wide and said, I give myself to, the, to all who want to know the love of my Father. And that is what we must do. We must be, you know, Billy Graham said it great. I love what Billy Graham, he, he said, and I hope I'm, I probably mess it up, but he said, how can God flow through you when you're like this? You must come to God like this. You get what I'm saying? It doesn't belong to you. It never belonged to you. Just be a flowing, living vessel for the glory of God. If you can trust God with $5, $10, can't you trust Him with $1,000? Can't you trust Him with anything? If you can trust God with the salvation of your soul, can't you trust Him with any amount of money? With anything that you're going through, cancer, divorce, addictions, perversions, whatever it is. If you can trust God for salvation, can't you trust him to help you to break free from any of these things? From doubt, from unbelief, from anger, from slander. Proverbs eleven twenty four through 25 says this. It says, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. You know why you give? It's for the glory of God. The more you give, listen, the more you give, the more you give God the glory. Your sacrifice and giving has to be felt. Abraham was going to sacrifice his son. He was going to feel it. God sacrificed his son. He was going to feel it. And when you give a sacrifice, giving of your time, of your talents, of your treasure, you got to feel it. Because if not, it's not biblical. There's a lot of things you want to do in life. Me, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't want to be here. I'd rather pack up, start a church up in the hill country. Live out the rest of my days with on up in the hill country. I've always got these ideas. Oh, I could do this. I could do this. I've even seen some of the land buildings up there. Oh, man. But the Lord says, uh uh uh. You go, you go on your own. And so I'm not telling you anything that I'm not myself doing. You got to do what God wants of your own free will, and He'll get the glory. I'm giving of my time. I'm giving of my talents. He has anointed me to do certain things. He's anointed you. But you give it unto him and say, I'm not going to do it my way. I'm going to do it your way. Because there is something that only you can do for this moment. But if you don't rise up and do what you can do, eventually God will bring someone else in. So the ministry of giving is incredible. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I want to read this to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7 and 8, in that context of that chapter, the Apostle Paul is talking to the church, to the churches, about helping the church in Jerusalem with money. Because the church in Jerusalem was the mother church at the time, and they were going through incredible hardship. 
the pastor of the church in Jerusalem was James. And the, he was known to have wobbly knees because he was always on his knee praying. And James was eventually killed. But he was a prayer warrior. And this is where the gospel first started, right there in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was going through an incredibly hard time. And Paul, who was so far away in ancient, far away biblical ancient lands, he heard about the suffering and the persecutions that they were, his brothers were going through in Jerusalem. And Paul began to gather up and encourage all the churches that he had been affiliated, uh, building up. He says, hey, we need to give and help our brothers in Jerusalem. And so Paul begins to introduce to the entire church age, us today, what it means to be a giver. Because it's one thing to be a tither. It's a whole nother realm to be a New Testament giver. You hear what I'm saying this morning? Amen. And think about it. Your tithe is 10% of what you make. And that is a principle I am not downgrading. I'm not saying you don't need to tithe. I am not saying that. Please don't give me. That is an incredible principle to live by. It is. Because Abel did it. The patriarchs did it before it was ever implemented. There is nothing wrong with implementing the tithe in your life today. But tithing is training wheels to being a giver. You're giving. A New Testament giver will outgive what the principle of tithing teaches. It will. I see it in the scripture and I know it as a pastor and that is what I believe. It says here, Paul begins to speak and introduce the ministry of giving. He says in 2 Corinthians 8, 7 through 8, he says, since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, he says, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I am not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. 2 Corinthians 8, 7 through 8. Paul is saying, and again, God, is a, God honors your free will. God is not going to force you to do anything. Now, he did command the Israelites to tithe, but God does not command the church to do that. God is saying through Scripture, I want to encourage you to do this. Paul is writing this through the hand of the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you to be a giver. Show your love. Don't just say, I love you. Show it. Prove it. There are people hurting in this world and they could use some help. You have that help. Look at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8, 11 through 14. Paul says here, Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable. And if you give it eagerly and give according to what you have and not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean that your giving should make life easier for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now, you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later, they will have plenty and can share with you then when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. Look, there are times in your life where you are able to help. And there will be times in your life where you've needed that help. Can anyone testify to that? Amen. 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 And you know what? Paul is basically saying, God remembers that. What did we read in Proverbs 11.24? It says here, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. When you had many, much to help somebody with and you didn't help, but when your time comes, what happens? God is not trying to judge you. God is disciplining you to break us free from the spirit of mammon, the love of money. That's what God is trying to, he's trying to discipline you to say, hey, I'm letting you go through some hard times so that way you come to an understanding that you're gonna have good days and bad days. What did the apostle Paul say? I know what it's like to have plenty and I know what it's like to have nothing, but I rejoice in all things. There are going to be times where you're going to have nothing. There are going to be times you have plenty. When you have plenty, give. And that's what he means. Give in proportion to what you have. Because sometimes there, you're going through seasons of very hard times. You have nothing to give. But even then, you still have something to give. 
And, and, and this is where we need to see the glory of God. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15, moving quickly, I want to read this to you and listen to what the Holy Spirit says through Scripture here, what Paul says in the church. And this is very common sense. This is not just applied towards money. This is applied towards life, your time, your talent, your treasure. Listen, Paul says, remember this. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Did you hear that? Some of us will be stuck in spiritual and physical poverty because we are never truly giving what God has put in our heart to give. Do you like promotion from your jobs? Do you like pay increases from your job? I've known people in my life as Christians who gave and gave. Some people were, were giving 80%, 60% of their income, but yet they were blessed beyond imagination. And you don't give because you want to be rich. You give because you know it's going to advance the kingdom of God. People are going to be blessed by what you do. Time, your talents, your treasure. This is advancing the kingdom of God. Now hold on, wait, we're not done yet. Wait till we, wait till we get down to the book of Genesis. I'm almost, I'm almost there. Paul says here in, verse, in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, he says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Either God's a liar or God's telling the truth. It says, as the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Verse 10, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. The kingdom is advanced. Did you hear that? When you give and they distribute those gifts, they will thank God. The kingdom will be advanced Amen. by giving. Amen. Amen. Verse 12. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. Advancing the kingdom. Verse 13. As a result of your ministry, they will glorify God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift. Too wonderful for words. This is the ministry of giving. Amen? Amen. This is the ministry of giving. Now, I want to take you to a biblical story before we close. And it's called Abraham's victory. Now, there was a king who was known as the king of Elam. E-L-A-M. King of Elam. He, and please forgive me. I'm Texan. Okay. His name was Shur, Sh, 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 uh, Shedorlamor. C-H-E-D-O-R-L-A-O-M-E-R. Shedorlamor. You can find it in Genesis chapter 14. Now, let me just tell you something about this king of Elam. This king was a giant killer. Let me give you a little bit of a background about this king before I speak about his encounter with Abraham. This king was a giant killer. If you read in the, in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, this king shared a little more. There, I said it. Amen. All right. This king was a giant killer. He had destroyed the Raphites, the Amalekites. These were giant killers. Now, you may never have heard this before, but this is what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches in Genesis chapter 6 about the Nephilim, or the Nephilim, however you want to say it. They were the sons of God, fallen angels, who had sexual relations with the daughters of men, human girls. 
and it produced an inbred race, the Nephilim, giants. And this is the main reason why the flood came upon the earth. Because Satan was trying to destroy human DNA to stop the coming of the Messiah. Because in Genesis 3.15, God told Eve and the serpent, Eve, your offspring will crush the head of Satan, your offspring. And Satan knew that a Messiah was going to come and destroy. Satan knew the Messiah was going to come and destroy his kingdom. And so that is why they started to see these fallen angels doing what they did. Think about it. People think that this sounds like a crazy thing. No, it's not. Because when the two angels went into Sodom and Gomorrah, the people of the city tried to have sex with these two angels. And this was sexual immorality at its fullest. Before a society is judged, and that is where America is today. I love this nation. I thank God for this nation. I'm an American. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else besides right here in Texas. But I'm going to tell you something. We are under judgment as the rest of the nations are. But we are leading the way because of the immorality trying to poke a finger in the eye of God. Now, this king killed a lot of those giants because the Bible says in Genesis 6 there were giants before the flood and also after the flood. You get what I'm saying? This was, a, this was, a, this was a, a race of people that God did not allow. It wasn't created by God. And you know how David killed the giant Goliath? It's incredible. Nine feet, nine, ten feet tall. But this king of Elam, he was killing giants. He was a giant killer. So do you can imagine when he comes into Sodom and Gomorrah and he takes Lot captive, Abraham's nephew, he takes him captive and he takes him off as a prisoner. Can you imagine the fear that everybody had? They heard about the king of Elam doing all these, killing everybody. And now he's, he's taken over Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me pick this up. In Genesis 14, 11 through 12, it says, The victorious invaders then plundered Sodom and Gomorrah, and they headed for home, taking with them all the spoils of war and the food supplies. And they also captured Lot, Abraham's nephew, who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they carried off everything Lot owned. That is what the devil wants. The devil wants to take everything you own, everything you hold dear to your heart. Why? Why did Lot go into Sodom and Gomorrah in the first place? The Bible says that he pitched his tents looking towards Sodom and Gomorrah because it was a city that flourished. It was something that was appealing to Lot. The spirit of mammon. A, 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 a spirit to want more in life. A spirit to want more in life that is outside of the will of God. You hear what I'm saying? And that's what got Lot in trouble. He was in the wrong place. Lot should have never been there. But just like Abraham, he told Lot years before, brother, you take anywhere you want. If you go this way, I'll go that way. Remember he told him that? You go that way, I'll go over this way. And so Lot looked and Lot goes, ah, I'm going to go that way. That is symbolic of God always honoring your free will. But you reap what you sow. And when you sow a little, you reap a little. When you sow greatly, you reap greatly. That applies to every facet of your life, Christian. And so if you just keep giving the same of your time, your talent, and your treasure, you just keep giving the same, giving the same, expect the same. Because God said, no, I'm going to give my very best. He gave his son. Are you giving your very best for the advancement of the kingdom of God? Do you count it an honor and a privilege to come before the throne of God to serve Him in this sin-dying world? In Genesis 14, 14, verse 16 through 24. So in Genesis chapter 14, verse 14, and then 16 through 24, let me read verse 14. It says, when Abraham heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, he mobilized the 318 trained men who had been born into his household. And then he pursued uh, the king, Kertilomor, army until he caught up with them at Dan. You hear that? This man was a giant killer. And all Abraham needed was his 318 men. The devil is not expecting much from the little churches around the world today. 
There's a little, there's little of us. We get discouraged, churches. I'm, man, I know a lot of, I know a lot of their pastors out there that, that are small churches. You know, but a lot of people that like to go to the lights, the churches with the lights and the bells and the whistles, thinking that the presence of God is in that. And you know, I'm not judging that, you know, but, but what I am saying is this, is that you know when the Holy Spirit is in a place. You know that. And it's not man-made. And so wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is liberty. And the Spirit of God was in the house of Abraham. And Abraham said, I got 318 men. He didn't question God because he had questioned God basically before, years before, when he lied to the Pharaoh. Remember that? Oh, she's not my wife, she's my sister. When he talked about Sarah, remember that? He was lying. By now, he knew to trust God. He had faith. That's why at this point in the Bible story, Abraham was called the friend of God because he believed in God. He was free from the spirit of man. And by the way, the Bible says that Abraham was a very rich man. Why? Because he knew how to give. He was a giver. He said, hey, Lot, you do whatever you want to do and I'll go the other way. He knew that wherever Lot decided to go, Abraham knew God was going to take care of him wherever he went. You get what I'm saying? So no matter if I'm pastoring in the hill country or pastoring here, God's going to always meet my way too. Always has and always will. Because I know there's a great audience that listen. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So verse 16, Genesis 14, 16. Abraham recovered all the goods that had been taken and he brought back his nephew Lot. He destroyed that king so quickly. Hallelujah. It says, and with his possessions and all the women and all the captives. Verse 17. After Abraham returned from his victory over Kirtilomor and all of his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abraham in the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. Watch this. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and a high priest of the God Most High, he brought Abraham some bread and wine. And Melchizedek blessed Abraham with this blessing, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe, a tithe, a tenth of all the goods that he had recovered. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give back my people who were captured, but you may keep all for yourself all the goods you have recovered. And Abraham replied to the king of Sodom, I solemnly swear to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take so much as a single thread or sandal thong from what belongs to you. Otherwise, you might say, I am the one who made Abraham rich. I will only accept what my young warriors have already eaten, and I request that you give a fair share of the goods to my allies, Aner, Eshal, and Mamre. Abraham knew that what when he went to battle Abraham knew exactly what was going on Abraham knew that this was a test Abraham sensed the spirit of mammon listen Abraham knew that as he was going to recover his nephew Lot and all the people that had been lost he knew that this was a test on his faith that this would be a challenge this would be a challenge this would be a challenge to who this would be a challenge to Abraham this would be a challenge to him on whether he could accept what the king was wanting or to accept what the king of Salem was wanting. And who is the king of Salem? Many believe that the king of Salem, Melchizedek, the high priest, was a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Many believe that. But here's what I got to say. That, that king of Salem was so incredible, he was the one that says... I bless you, Abraham. And here's the patriarch being blessed by this great king. And he tells the king of Sodom, I don't need nothing from you. And Abraham was saying that all of what this is about is that the spirit of mammon is trying to get in the way of my giving. And I'm giving to the one who is holy. 
I'm giving it to one who his kingdom is advancing. That is exactly what Abraham was saying. He says, I'm going to be a rich man, but it's only going to be by the hand of God. Because I give rightly to where it belongs to. Are you giving to the king of Salem? Are you giving to this high priest of God, Jesus Christ, correctly? Don't think about it. Seriously. Are you giving of your time, of your talents, and of your treasure? Are you giving? So many churches are hurting out there. You know, I'm really saddened by what I see in the churches, what I see at Grace Christian Center. So many called, so many anointed, and yet so many have abandoned their posts. So many have walked away from, from Christian fellowship. Like I said earlier, they're in our music. The sons of God in the book of Job, they went up before God's throne, and so did Satan. Satan knew that it was important to be in the presence of God with others. And we need to understand how important it is to be in the presence of God with others, our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not just about coming to church. It's about being the church. And, you know, many are called, but a few are chosen. And what I believe is happening today is I believe that there is a great sifting that is going on in the churches worldwide. Because before the judgment hits the, the streets of the world, the judgment of God is going to hit the church first. I'm saddened because there's a lot of people that I love and hold dear to my heart, but they're so far from God right now. And if the rapture was to happen, then people laugh about this, but if the rapture was to happen today, what would happen to these people? But you see, my God is bigger than that. And at the same time, I have to stay focused on the walk that I have with Jesus. to advance his kingdom. Amen. Amen. This is advancing his kingdom part two. <laughs>